So um, my, name, my name is Graham Howarth, I'm a design director at Howarth Tompkins Architects in London and um, I want to talk a little bit about a building we just completed for the Royal College of Art in, in Battersea, which is the Dyson Building. And it's a building to take um, two of the remaining fine art programmes that are currently located in Kensington and move them down to Battersea and it's a, for basically a building uh, for printmaking and uh, photography. And it's really a building that supports those, those practices. It's a very technically based building. And what we, we want to sort of get across in, in this talk is, is how we went about making the building, particularly the use of concrete in the building. Um, the location of the building is just behind the main river frontage in Battersea, on, uh, immediately behind uh, Albion Riverside. And the, the site forms an entire urban block, and it was an originally um, originally designed it as an RBA competition, uh, which we won in 2007. And um, it's been designed to be built into, in three separate phases. Um, and the latest phase of this is the, is the Dyson building, which is the second of the three. And the building has got uh, a very public-facing frontage onto the, the, the uh, Battersea Bridge Road uh, facade. And then behind, in the, in the more interior point of, part of the block, it's much more industrial. And um, there's a large double height foyer which has views over the river, which, which serves as a, a support space um, for the lecture theatre behind. There's a 220 seat lecture theatre in there. And the whole building is organised in two parallel blocks and it's arranged around a central uh, daylit space, a double height space, which we call the, uh, the machine hall. And this is going to take uh, a lot of the large printing machines. And in the next building we're, we're building, this is a similar um, idea carries through, and that's going to uh, house um, a lot of the kilns and um, ceramic machines for, for ceramics and glass. And then this, the, the whole building is, is, is seen very much as, a, as an art factory, a, a place where art can be produced. Um, and we, we really like this idea of it being a, a place of production in terms of its factoriness, but also the fact that it, it can resonate with sort of the, the production of art in, in, a, in, a, in a sense like the Warhol's um, factory. Uh, and then there are all sorts of resonances like factory records. So we, we quite enjoyed the whole idea of the building being an industrial process based facility and the creativity of the students uh, comes into that. So it's very much a building that supports other activities. And part of that was to try and create a lot of uh, horizontal drift and visual transparency through the building. So you get these very long views through. So you can see other people working. It may be part of your discipline. It may, be, you may just be a member of the public wandering through. But the, the idea is to try and get in a lot of um, visual complexity and, and visual connectivity through. Um, this, this illustration shows the, um, the makeup of the building, really, with the four-story workshop block on the, uh, on the right and the double height machine hall in the, in the centre. And in the next phase, this, this central portion gets extruded out to, to form the whole development. We followed the, the factory aesthetic through into the, the making of the building. So we've used quite simple materials in a very direct way. Uh, you can just see the reflections of the sawtooth roof of the painting school opposite, which is the first phase that we completed. And we used the painting school to road test really a lot of the ideas that we transferred into the second phase and they will also be transferred into the third phase. So on the, on the left is a cross section of the Sackler building with the double height painting studios with smaller studios looking down. And we also prototyped these north lit sawtooth roof forms as well which, which get very good um, north light into the spaces provide constant light for working. And again, those are something we're, we're, we're transferring over into the, the new building. We tried to look at, at precedents that, that captured that idea of, um, of a creative work and, and, and making going on in an industrial environment. And I've always liked this building in, uh, in Germany by Uwe Kaiser. It was finished in the mid-80s, and it's a technical support facility for Erko Lighting. And he came up with this phrase that he wanted the building to be an, an overall for engineers, so it was a piece of clothing, an, art, an artifact that, that helped them uh, in, in their work. So it was very useful, it had pockets, zips, and it protected, protected you when you were doing the, 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 the machinery. So we, we thought that was a really good metaphor. And then more recently, we, we're very interested in provisionality of space and, and things that 
change over time. And, and Stephen Hole's building at Iowa, he, he uses the expression a hybrid instrument. So it's not a specific architectural environment, it's not pinned down, it's very fluid, very open, and, and again, you, you, you get quite large uh, distance views through, through from one space to another. In terms of um, the use of concrete, um, we've, we've always had, as a practice, a very strong interest in, in concrete, and my, my personal um, sort of love of it goes back to, to being a student, really, and I, I want to show three slides by a Japanese architect called Kazuo Shinohara, who had, had a, a big influence on, on a lot of uh, the younger generation of, um, of Japanese architects like Toi Ito and Hasegawa in the fact that he was trying to introduce social issues and local vernacular, Japanese vernacular issues back into architecture as a, as a sort of reaction to metabolism and a lot of the sort of uh, global ideas that Japanese architects were interested in in the 60s. He reacted against that. And he, he used concrete in a very elemental and organic way. And this is uh, one of his early buildings, uh, it's a house. And uh, he's exposed the, the concrete structure within. It's it, almost in a very, um, almost in a primordial way, really. It's very, uh, it feels very primitive, almost though like it's a, a natural material from the earth. And it has a sort of poetry to it. And, and we, we, we like that aspect of, of, of concrete. So it's almost, Along with stone, it's probably the only material that has that, that sort of really strong poetic quality to it. He used the, the concrete in a, in a much more fluid way. He, he was very interested in um, the idea of form following function, and he wanted one material to do several jobs. So concrete's perfect for that. It's the, it's the, the perfect modernist material, in fact. You can go from a wall to a column to a floor seamlessly, and you don't have to clad it in anything, it's not like steel or timber where you're, you're building a carcass and then lining it. it it's, it's a material that does everything and it's finished. In his later work he started to get a little bit more um, crude, I think, in the way he used concrete. And I, and I think this is kind of interesting in, 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 in the way that we've used it in the Dyson building. We're using it as an, an elemental material that forms the primary surfaces and against that We've placed more industrial artifacts such as gantries, roof lights, ductwork, all, all the sort of more temporal things that, that will probably change over time. They're set against the permanency of the concrete. So in our top floor daylight studios for photography, for example, we're using the frame, exposing the concrete to that to set the, the basic armature of the space, but then we're playing other things against it. In the building, we've used concrete in two, two primary ways. One is uh, for the main structure of the building and the main circulation spaces and cores and that, that, for that we've used in situ concrete and then the other use of concrete is um, through precast elements for the, the main facade material facing the, the main street frontage. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, the in situ use first um, and, and particularly rather than talk about the whole building I'm just going to focus on the main foyer space which is a triple height space which tries to uh, express this, this idea of visual transparency and movement through the building in, in this sort of hybrid way. Uh, you enter the building directly on the axis of the main machine hall, so you've got a very strong view into the process spaces. And then there's a very uh, sculptural staircase which takes you off and up to the foyer spaces of the lecture theatre and then even further up into to other support spaces. And that first floor foyer has a very uh, strong connection with the river and we've used concrete in its plastic form to create this very dynamic and sinuous um, staircase which almost sort of crystallises the metaphor of movement through the building. When you get up to the upper foyer, again we, we've exposed all the concrete surfaces within the space and we're setting other, other lighter elements against it, whether it's light fittings and ductwork or, or display walls, they're, they're inserted within the sort of carcass of the, the building. We've also used a, a polished concrete floor throughout most of the public spaces and in the studio spaces we've just used an in-situ concrete screed which is quite sort of tough and buff. And against the earthiness of the concrete other elements are set whether it's quite elaborate sliding door mechanisms or whether it's the, the art that the, the students are making within the building. And what's, what's fascinating about concrete to us is that it's it's completely plastic, it's, it's almost a, a, a liquid, um, like liquid stone in a way, and 
what is really obvious to state about it is to actually make something out of it. You have to create a mould in the, in the first instance. And I've always been interested in the way ritual white readers cast negative space in existing moulds, be them existing buildings or existing staircases. And in a way, her job's slightly easier because the mould already, already exists and you can walk around it, whereas we have to sort of get our head around uh, making a, a mould to, to then, a, a negative mould, to cast a positive object which then creates the space. So it's sort of two steps removed from what she's doing in a way. And the only way we can do that is to make a lot of models and three-dimensional representations of the space be before we can commit to the design. And as you see here, there are some very complex geometrical collisions and interfaces between the different surfaces within, within the main foyer space. And to try and secure the quality of that through a, through a build process, it's necessary for us to actually physically draw every component and work out how our mould goes together and what the imprint of that mould is going to have, the effect that mould is going to have on the, um, on the surfaces that are, that are cast from it. So that really necessitates drawing every condition, drawing every joint line and setting out every bolt connection that holds the former together. And that, that applies to the soffit scape as well where you have to understand that the, the soffit is all, all, also cast from, um, from the same process and that needs an equal level of care and dexterity if, you, if you're going to be successful with it. Prior to letting the contract, we interviewed various contractors and made sure that their primary subcontractors, um, in, in this case it was Waits, were, were the main contractor, and, and a company called Tureen Mannion uh, were the subcontractor. We needed to ensure that they understood the quality we were getting, that they priced it appropriately when they were tendering. And we went to visit a couple of buildings with them to talk, you know, to inspect other people's work and work that they'd done before to, to set the quality benchmark. And then when they got into their process of, of working drawings, they provided us with a whole series of shop drawings which, which illustrated the form of the way that worked, um, where the, the mould joints and panel joints occurred on each, um, on each uh, particular wall or surface. And a lot of it was quite iterative. We, we would put forward a proposal for what our ideal symmetrical arrangement of bolts and panels would be, and then they would come back and say, that doesn't quite work, we can't do it like that, it's not efficient, there's a lot of wastage. And, and we would move through the whole process together. So the communication with the maker of the concrete and us as designers was, was really critical, and that, that dialogue um, was, was really important to establish. When we got onto site, we then tested a series of prototypes, um, full-scale walls, columns and soffits to make sure that the quality was coming through. We used a, a timber former, a plywood former, with a special surface coating. We were getting probably three or four repeat uh, uses of these moulds. And we tried to establish benchmarks for the quality of the surface, the um, level of um, Sort of pop marks and blow holes that you get, and also the treatment of the, the main bolt holes. And the mix we used here was was um, a Portland cement with a, um, a, a blast furnace slag component of about 40%, which gives the, the concrete its creaminess and its, its whiteness. And then the other two components in that are obviously the sand and the aggregate. And we, those were very, very carefully specified within, within the, uh, the contract documents. And as the building evolved, we began to see that this this negative mould that we'd made in the formwork was then turning into positive elements which were creating the overall space and we really enjoyed a lot of the, the way that these junctions between columns and surfaces came about. And here for example we, we tried to uh, articulate the actual movement of the staircase with the, the way that it was structurally supported so there's a distinction between the column and the, the actual wall surface. And also we wanted to try and avoid kicker joints be between the staircase and the, and the walls, so we cast the walls first, that's where you get this sort of uh, detailed um, line running underneath the, the soffit of the, the upper flights and how we've managed to achieve a, a very monolithic feel to the stair as you're looking down onto it. We managed to achieve a really high standard of, of quality uh, throughout, throughout the installation and it does have the sort of very elemental abstract sculptural qualities which we were looking for in, in, the, in the design. <coughs> and on the top of the staircase we wanted to get a, a very simple profile detail, often you knock the tops off concrete to, to make sure it doesn't get damaged, but we inserted a little moulding into the formwork so when it was pulled away 
you had a, a very nice ridge detail which protected the main wall but give, gave the concrete a, a sort of subtle um, detail at, at the top which was, was actually quite sophisticated and it's really just achieved by a, a 10 by 5 mil baton applied to the plywood. So while the main foyer was being built, the rest of the building was, was in construction and we used concrete throughout basically for all the, the main service cores, for all the structural floors. Um, the advantage is that it's finished once it's cast, it doesn't need to be fire proofed or fire rated in any way. Um, we enjoyed it on occasion using lighter weight materials to set against the, the heaviness of the concrete. So at the top, on the main photographic studios, we're using steel structure and the central uh, machine hall has also got steel truss roof. So the idea of something quite relatively lightweight being bolted onto something quite heavy is, is, is again something that you know, we really were exploring in the design. And this whole idea of making the building in the same way as the, the use of the buildings for making things, we, we were interested in making the building and expressing how it went together. And throughout, even through the secondary spaces, we were achieving a very high standard of, of quality uh, throughout. The second element of the, of, of, of the use of concrete um, in the building is, is the use of the precast on the outside. It's, it's almost like a terrazzo. It's a highly polished uh, black aggregate concrete, basalt uh, aggregate concrete. And it's, um, again, it's, it's a bespoke product. It's handmade um, in, in Belgium, a company called Docomo. And you can see the guy in the illustrations here um, hand polishing part of the, part of the profile. We, we selected um, a, series of, um, a series of basalt um, aggregate particles and we had a series of test samples made, which, which at Tender we, we did so that we could go to anybody. But in the end, it was only this company that could actually replicate the mix of the samples they gave us. They have a sort of secret recipe, which nobody else was able to replicate. And they have some uh, little shiny elements that go into to the, to the mix, which again, we don't know what they are, but they just have a way of making it. So it, 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 you know, it, the main contract was, was led to Docomo in the end. Uh, primarily because they were the only people that could um, to get the standards and the, the qualities we were looking at. We were almost trying to get the, the quality of polished granite in a way through, through the concrete. And um, not all of the concrete is polished by hand, it was just the, the edges that are, that are polished. They have a, a flatbed polishing machine so you can get high levels of, sh of shine and, um, and clarity to the, to the columns. We went over to the factory to inspect the main the main batch production for quality, and um, we then, in parallel with that, worked out how we might how we might put the, the concrete panels into a cladding system. So we worked with the uh, our cladding consultant Harry Montresor to devise a preliminary detail about how the concrete would be assembled within the curtain walling, um, which was then developed by GIG, the subcontractor. Um, into a, into a working assembly. So we took the, the panels from Docomo and then we built a whole series of um, tesserae prototypes in Austria uh, with GRG. And, and one of the most interesting details about it is how we closed down the, the cavity between the concrete and the, the backing substrate. And we invented this little flipper gasket. Um, originally, Harry proposed some form of squashable stuff, which nobody quite knew what it was. Um, and through the technical development with GIG, we, we went for almost like one of those little pinball flippers that, that is a continuous um, neoprene seal that runs all the way around the panels and it, it acts under tension. So once the panels are pressed into place, the, um, the gasket forms a, a waterproof seal. And that's how it looks in, in main elevation. There's a little bit of funny junction at the center where you had to in, um, put, make a special um, interlocking piece to deal with that. And that's how the, the arrangement of the panels go in, in plan. They're, they're supported off the steel, the steel substrate and the, this is a concrete to concrete junction so it's a sort of V-junction between the two and the flipper gaskets. You can just see there's one just attached to the back of the uh, left-hand panel formed a weather seal. And where we have a con concrete on, on concrete detail we pin the two concrete panels together this shows where the uh, aluminium detail and the concrete come together and we wanted a, an almost zero tolerance detail. We wanted the, the aluminium to be flush with the polished concrete and, and to, to achieve that we, we had to build in very rigorous site tolerances but it went together beautifully in the end. And we tested this out on the, uh, the, the test rig in, in Austria at GRG's factory. 
so we can see how all the, all the details met together, how the alignment worked. And then we could also look at testing the uh, water penetration factors on, on the panel. So the whole thing was tested uh, on, a, on a wet rig, spray rig as well. And that meant that when, when we actually built the building, it, uh, it went together remarkably, um, remarkably smoothly. Um, and it's, it's created a very uh, smooth, smooth facade. We've got a very minimal detail at the parapet. It's almost, it tips backwards, so you can't actually see it from the street. So the concrete looks like it's forming the, um, uh, the edge. And then at the base, we've got a large uh, stainless steel channel, which just sets the concrete up above the, um, the gallery space and the foyer space below. I mean, our, our use of the two different types of concrete in the building has been very deliberate, in, and it's been influenced really by, I suppose, our, our desire to create a very sculptural interior, which not only is it beautiful, but also it's very robust and can be knocked about by, by students. So that, that's the use of the in-situ concrete. I think in the UK, there's been a tradition of associating in-situ concrete or raw concrete on the exterior of the buildings with, with brutalism and buildings are not particularly well loved by, by the public. And I think that has influenced our thinking about the choice of material for the outside. So rather than use the same um, cementitious material um, on the, for the facades, we deliberately chose to use a more sophisticated, more finished product. Uh, still concrete, but bordering more towards terrazzo. So we, we used something that had um, an inherent colour, it had a, a high sheen, a high, um, high level of finish. And I think that, that has been influenced by how concrete weathers over time, particularly in this country. And, and I'm not sure on this street frontage whether raw concrete would, would have been the right one to, to use, because I, I think there's, we needed to communicate a, a different quality of the building. It had to really communicate the more public facing end of the, the Royal College of Art and the more, corporate's the wrong word, but it had to have a more, more level, a higher level of, uh, of finish. Uh, the building has just been recently completed in, in September um, and opened, it opens to the students in October for the first academic term and we had a, an opening ceremony uh, the other day which was a really good moment uh, to see the building full of people and full of, full of life and there was a special opening ceremony which uh, James Dyson attended where he printed off a, um, an original print uh, by, by Peter Blake on, on the etching press and it was a really nice moment to uh, just mark the, the end of this next uh, phase of development for the college and we're just out to tender at the moment and due to start on site in, uh, in January 2013 with the, the final phase of, of, of this, this whole project, uh, which is an, an extension of the central workshop block to form studios for ceramics and glass and what's known as GSM and J, which is goldsmithed metalwork and jewellery, together with some sort of non-denominational studio spaces for other fine art practices. And that should be open and up and running by uh, September 2014. One of the, the really nice things about the project for us was that it was a very personal project for the college. It was a very big move for them to develop a, a new site in Battersea. They wanted the building to represent their ethics, their e ethos, and their ambitions, and, and actually reflect the Royal College. So it needed to have the characteristics that the existing college has, and that, that was made it a really personal project. And it was also, part of that was also, it was a very bespoke project. The, um, the users that are going in it are all, they've all got very specific disciplines. And that lent itself to a very bespoke response in the architecture. Whilst it had to be flexible, it had to be a bespoke response to the, the equipment systems and the, the, teachings, the teaching methods that the academics use. And it's quite rare to get that level of bespoke design and end user design, everything these days is, is tending towards the generic and the, the non-specific, whereas this is very specific. And that translated itself into the use of um, the materials, the, the, main con the choice of main contractor through weights and also the, the choice of the subcontractors. We had two um, extraordinary subcontractors in Tareem Mannion doing the in situ and, and uh, GIG doing the, the exterior facades. And I think that was almost a statement from the college that they, they, you know, that they wanted to benchmark the building at a certain level that reflected their quality of, of design and their, their aspirations too.